Okay, right, I met some of the caregivers across the hall, and I just want to thank them so much for our plan A, plan B, plan C, and then plan D, kind of back and forth, so I appreciate that quite a bit. Um, all right, I am a clinical pain psychologist based in Birmingham, Alabama. I've done this pain-specific work since about 1998 in graduate school, and it's become my passion. I do not have CRPS, but I am a strong ally. Um, 99% of my clinical practice patients live with some sort of chronic pain, and about 15% to 20% have a diagnosis of CRPS, so I'm, I'm uh, very much interested in it. So we're gonna switch gears during this talk. All day today you have heard amazing, um, tested and tried and new and novel medical treatments, um, some holistic treatments for sure, but we're gonna kind of move into the mental health realm. And I, I apologize, my voice will probably go. I'm on day 10 of the flu, so that's great. So <laughs> this is gonna go away, but I will croak it out for you guys. My first sort of soapbox issue is that taking care of your mental health is taking care of your medical health. There should be no distinction between those two things. There should be no stigma attached to taking care of your mental health. There should be no disparities in how much it costs to see a physician versus seeing a therapist in your community. And it's ridiculous that there is that dichotomy. Um, so I really feel like there should not be a distinction. That's, or I'll get off my soapbox on that. So when we talk mental health, we are talking, taking care of your physical health as well. So we all know the data, right? 100 million people living with chronic pain. About 50 million people living with high impact chronic pain. That's a new buzzword in the chronic pain literature, high impact chronic pain. That's people living with moderate to severe daily pain that has a very strong impact on our daily functioning, quality of life, family interventions, the economic impact of it. And so it's a very, very high number. About the prevalence of CRPS, about 26.2 per 100,000 is the incidence. And that's pretty, it's still, it's pretty rare. That's why I think it confuses so many um, physicians. But considering there are that many people living with chronic pain, has anyone here ever felt isolated by or alone with your pain? with that many people, and it's amazing, isn't it, that we just feel, we truly, to be completely honest, you are the only one who knows what you feel. You're the only one. It is so difficult to communicate your specific and individual range of symptoms to healthcare providers, to family members and friends, uh, your caregivers try so hard to empathize. I had um, one, I think it was a, a, a husband, who tries to imagine what it feels like when his feet go numb and it kind of they wake back up again and they're so painful and do the math, multiply that by, you know, a hundred times. And that's such a wonderful way to empathize, but we can't really know how you feel. And that very fact is so isolating. Does anyone, because of that, because your chronic pain is that invisible illness, does anyone ever feel like their symptoms get minimized, right? You're too young to have pain. You know, you're here at the ER again. That's a, you're, you know, Your limb isn't swollen at this one five-minute visit that I see you at, so I'm not sure I actually believe you. How does it feel to be told that your symptoms are confusing or difficult to treat? Terrible, right? It compounds it all. And now, I think Dr. Moskowitz said this earlier. Everyone has been frustrated by pain, right? Who here has been frustrated by it? Why me? This isn't fair. How about saddened by the losses that you've experienced because of the pain? Feel down, depressed, hopeless sometimes, right? And anxious about the pain? If I feel this bad now, how am I going to feel in five years? Anyone feel that? So these moods, these moods we think are reactions to pain, okay? I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna blow your minds. They are also par part of the pain experience. Those moods are pain. Now Dr. Moskowitz discussed the definition of pain as this kind of sensory experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And the definition expands beyond that to discuss the sensory and emotional 
experience of pain. So the emotional parts of the pain experience are right there in the definition. It would be weird if we didn't react to them, right? So doing a little bit of brain 101, and Dr. Chopra, had just, he had that cute little drawing earlier this morning of that little brain and spinal cord, and this is sort of a fancy version of it. I don't know. Oh, we can't see the... Um, I don't have a pointer, but you can see the ascending pathways and the descending pathways there. So the trick to this is that all those ascending signals coming up from the brain, those are just signals, okay? Pain ain't pain till it reaches the brain. And I think that's a really important thing to take home. Pain ain't pain till it reaches the brain. So when we think about all these surgeries that we pursue, and I'm not against it, they can help some people, but truly the only surgery that is guaranteed to remove pain is a lobotomy. And are we ready for that? Some people raise their hand and like, sign me up. Where can I get the next lobotomy? But we really, I mean, that's no way to live a life. So we have to really attack. When Dr. Um, Chopra had said, we have to treat the pain at its source, Yes, those signals are the source, but the brain is where it's all at. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about the things that are happening at that level and how we can change the brain to treat the pain. Now, we have these ascending signals that go up to the somatosensory cortex. That's going to be the part of the brain that shows you kind of where the pain is located, which limb, how distally it's there, and kind of the general sensations, that cold that somebody mentioned, the tingling, the burning, the numbness, the um, shooting, the radiating, the electrical, the shocking. That part, the somatosensory cortex, processes that. But those signals continue on to these frontal areas of the brain. You can see places like the amygdala, the insula, the anterior cingulate cortex. Those are brain structures that are part of what's called the limbic system. That's your emotional processing system. So when the brain lights up like a Christmas tree, due to those ascending signals, the whole experience of the sensation and the mood, that's pain. That whole signature is pain. So it's not just how you feel physically. It's about what the sensation means to you. So I just want you to remember that. Now, these are the structures. But you can also see that those area, arrows go every which way, right? They go up, they go backwards. So that means we're not stuck. We're not stuck. If we make efforts to direct our attentional systems and our mood system to more positive, purposeful, humorous, and important and valued things for us, we can activate a descending pathway, a descending modulation system that can dim down those ascending signals. And I know for one, that makes me feel good, that I actually have more control over my pain signals than sometimes we even give ourselves credit for. So we want our healthcare teams to take a full approach, a biopsychosocial approach. So we know that pain doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? We have our tissue, our nerve trauma, the physical dysfunction that comes from it, and all of those heightened autonomic nervous system reactions, the fight or flight system, just gets super activated. So we know that's happening, but that's also tempered by our beliefs about pain, what does it mean for us? What does it make us label ourselves? Our expectancies for the future, how we cope, our emotions, our personality. Some people are lucky to be born with just this resilient personality. They call it, at one point, Teflon personalities, right? Things just slide right off of them. Good for you if you are one of those people. But if you're not, you're not stuck. But it, there's genetics and that all kind of plays a role. And then, of course, pain doesn't exist in the, in the social vacuum either. So our culture defines how we approach pain. We here in the Western culture approach pain and our, our uh, treatment strategies in a very different way than Eastern cultures. Different cultures view pain as just something, a normal part of life, something to um, be proud of, kind of a badge of honor. That's not quite how we approach it in the Western culture, and that's fine, but we have to know how that influences our, our reactions. And of course, family environment plays a role as well. 
So there's some interesting research on uh, caregiver reactions. And I had just read this, that this was a study done in elderly patients with osteoarthritis. And when a spouse talked about their spouse's pain or even watched their spouse have pain behaviors, their heart rate and blood pressure spiked. So caregivers can have physiological reactions just even being in the presence of the patient, their loved one with pain. We know that caregivers can inadvertently reinforce negative pain behaviors, right? So if there's some unhealthy things, too much rest or too much disuse or guarding of an affected limb, and we sort of give into that or we're solicitous of that, that can reinforce things in a negative way. But also caregivers, a, a caring and empathetic caregiver, even their presence can impact brain signals. They've done brain imaging research, um, having a patient with pain in an fMRI scanner, undergoing a painful procedure, and if there's a presence of a comforting significant other in the room, their brain does not light up as much. It's a much calmer pain signal than if there's an unpleasant or critical spouse or significant other in the room. So even the presence of a critical or calming caregiver there can really impact the patient's pain. So again, pain does not exist in a vacuum, and you want your caregivers to take this approach. We talk a lot at our clinic about the, patient, the person behind the pain. You know, who we are is what makes us interesting, right? The pain itself, I, this is gonna maybe sound rude, but it does not make you that interesting. Who we are makes us interesting. How we cope with trauma and adversity makes us interesting. So we want our healthcare team to get to know us, the person behind the pain. We want our caregiver to remember that they've got the, we talked in the caregiver support group about dual roles as a loving support person, but also having to be an advocate or a healthcare provider. Um, so we have to realize the disease can take center stage, but we have to remember who's behind that. And I will say it's most important for the patient themselves to not lose sight of who you are underneath the pain. What makes you unique is your generosity, your spirituality, your pursuit of knowledge, your creativity, your humor, your, uh, I don't know, I don't know, community um, involvement, whatever. All of that makes you unique. The pain can layer on top of that. It makes it more difficult for us to find our way on how to express those parts of ourselves, but it's really important to remember who we are underneath. Um, I wanna go through some of the major mood issues that, that we do see. Um, and so we'll talk about depression, anger, and anxiety. And then I wanna kind of go through those a little bit fast to get to some of the treatment methods. So depression and pain, you can read these statistics on here. They're not statistics, but we know that the greater the pain severity, the greater the presence and severity of depression symptoms. When pain and depression exist together, they're associated with greater disability and worse functional outcomes and greater risk of suicide. We'll talk about suicide in a moment. Depression and other negative moves actually might impact patients with CRPS greater even than in other pain conditions because it's going to sort of heighten that fight or flight autonomic sympathetic nervous system response, which is, can cause the nerves to, to signal and flare. So it's very important to treat mood in this condition as well. Um, there's a conservative estimate that I saw as well that 20% of caregivers suffer from depression and that's twice the rate of the general population. So again, if you're a caregiver experiencing mood reactions as well, um, please, please make sure you're taking care of yourself. Assessing depression, you know, you guys know what it looks like, right? This isn't, this isn't secret stuff. But the hallmarks of depression, sad or irritable mood, and kind of this lack of pleasure, lack of um, kind of the color in life, really kind of getting that, that joy anymore. And then of course there's all these hallmarks as well. Changes to sleep, either insomnia or hypersomnia, lack of interest in, in normal activities, feeling guilt, having low energy, low motivation, changes in concentration, either overeating or undereating, appetite changes, either uh, slowing down, the psychomotor kind of slowing, 
or a sense of agitation. So you can see some of these physical symptoms can go either way. And then suicidal thoughts. Now, you guys know that CRPS type 1 has been nicknamed what? The suicide disease, exactly. Now, there's not that much actual large-scale data on suicide rates. There was a decent-sized 2005 study. I think, actually, Jim Broach was involved in that. It was a web-based survey. And they estimated that about 20% of patients with CRPS attempted suicide. That's a large amount. And about 46.4% had ongoing suicidal thoughts. I think that's probably an underestimation. I, I, just, I mean, not that it was a wrong study, but I just think people don't always admit it. And so I feel like it is a very, very common thing to have those thoughts. And those thoughts can range from what's called passive death wishes. You know, I just wish I wouldn't wake up tomorrow. I wish God would take me home to a more peaceful place. Those are very common. And then, of course, it could range to actual suicidal ideation and intent. You know, I would like to take my own life to end the suffering. We always have to take this seriously. So if you are a patient who has gotten to that place, please share that information with a loved one. Don't be scared. They, who knows the reactions, but don't be scared to share that. Um, we want to take that seriously. Some risk factors include increased hopelessness, so kind of getting repeated disappointments and treatments, um, a feeling like you're a sense of burden to family. You're not. Just let me tell you that. They love you, and they want you here. That's the message that I get loud and clear from caregivers. It's tough, but they love you, and they want you here. So that sense of burden, loss of support, access to means. So if a caregiver asks to make your environment a little safer, to take over dispensing medications or locking up some things at home, please let them. It's not a sense of uh, uh, mistrust. It's just a sense they love you and they want to help you see a better day. The vast majority of suicide survivors who have attempted and survived, they are glad they survived. And what they realize is that pain, depression, it is not constant all the time. Even if you're at a 10 out of 10 and it seems like it's unrelenting, there will be days of a 9. It might go back up to a 10. It changes. And we want to be there to see what happens in the future for that. If you're feeling suicidal, make sure you reach out either to the family member or a national hotline, 1-800-SUICIDE or 1-800-273-TALK. Um, and so those are just ways, if you don't want to tell your family, you can talk to someone in an anonymous way. Now, one of the things that is often mistaken for clinical depression is this process we go through when we really evaluate our losses as a result of pain. The who here has said, I can't do what I used to do. Oh, it's the thing I hear the most often in my clinic. I have a little click box in my electronic health records because that's how often people say it. I know it's going to be said, and that's this, this sense of comparing to how it was before and coming up short now, and it just feels like this big loss of function. I miss my old self. I wish I could have my old life back. And we really recognize this cascade of pain-related losses the function, the comfort, the vitality, maybe financial stability. Now, interestingly, my patients say they have a difficult time with the loss of both the ability to plan ahead and the ability to be spontaneous. So both of those things, right? You don't know how you're going to feel next Tuesday, so it's hard to commit to friends if they invite you somewhere. And it's hard just to drop everything and say, oh, we'll just go off to lunch today, la di da. That's because it takes you longer to get ready than normal and that saps some energy. So we really lose just this ability to kind of live that life. Um, we also lose self-esteem. We're not getting the same attaboys maybe as we used to if we were working or in our social environment. All those opportunities for <sighs> well, just positive reinforcement, the attaboys in life. You know, you did a good job, or you look nice today. Those opportunities tend to peel away. And so we're kind of left with that rotten core. And no one really, well, not no one, but it's less frequent to get the praise or to get the attaboy for just living your life. You know, you did a great job taking a shower today. 
You know, nobody really says that. But how hard is it to take a shower? It's hard. So our sense of sort of, you know, our accomplishment and the size and scope of our accomplishments gets thrown off. So when we think about this, what is the emotional process we go through when we experience loss? Think of loss of a loved one. What do we go through? Grief. I heard that somewhere. So grief is this emotional experience. And grief looks a whole lot like clinical depression. Sadness and all of those physical changes that happen with it. And I think it's important. Some might be like, who cares what you call it? It's still sadness. I think it's important. Because with a clinical major depression, you might go down the treatment route to help rebalance neurotransmitters. Get on an antidepressant. Get into some heavy therapy. But... With, with grief, I hate to say it, we have to feel it. We have to feel it in all of its ugly, spiky bits. One of my patients, they envision grief as a long metal tunnel with these spikes at the front digging into it. And they can see that little light all the way at the end of that tunnel. But the only way to get through it is to go through, and it hurts so much in the beginning. Not just physical pain, but that emotional pain of, of, of confronting it. But the, if they keep getting through, it gets a little easier, little by little. And we know that it does with time. We just have to help ourselves get there. We want it to be linear, but it certainly does not work that way. So it is an ugly and tangled kind of process, usually. But I think it's important to acknowledge our losses, acknowledge the fact that we're angry and anxious and sad about the losses, and then find our way to the, the new normal. All right, anxiety. There's some normal anxiety due to pain. As we talked about, anxiety is part of the pain signature in the brain. All patients have stressors, some more than others. Our own coping skills and genetics determine how we're going to respond. Um, and I feel like it's important not to pathologize. We are so quick now to diagnose everything. And you just don't have to. You know, so you run hot. So you run a little agitated. You run a little stress reactive. Let's deal with it. That's who we are. We can figure it out. I think it tends to be over, over pathologized. Okay. Now, so there's normal anxiety after pain. And there can be abnormal anxiety before pain. That would be a true diagnosable anxiety disorder. And you can have abnormal anxiety after pain as well. And that would be some of the disorders like panic, uh, generalized anxiety, specific phobias, and so on. Um, one sort of special type that we see tons uh, a lot with uh, CRPS is sort of the fear of movement of the limb that's affected, fear of walking any distance because it will increase pain. And so when we immobilize the affected limb, that tends to lead to worse outcomes. It actually can increase the expression of neuroinflammatory mediators. You've heard a lot today, Dr. Chopra talked about it, and I think Dr. Moskowitz talked about it, that a lot of this has to do with nerve inflammation, right, from your immune system, the glial cells. And when we kind of are telling our body, oh, you better protect that, and you better not move that hand, or better not move that foot, it actually enhances those inflammatory markers. And it can strengthen that fear in the brain. It's like you're telling yourself, yeah, you should be scared. You better not move it. And the brain is like, oh, that's a lesson I better learn. And so these protective nets, these neural nets form around those fear centers in the brain, and it makes it harder and harder to treat that anxiety and start to use the limb again. So we definitely want you, I, I agree with Dr. Chopra, don't go into all the desensitization techniques, but definitely work in graded ways, slow-paced ways, to start using those areas of your body again. Treatment, of course, should focus on function um, while we calm anxiety about the movement. So it usually takes sort of a multidisciplinary um, treatment. And I always, I've always liked this phrase, you always miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So one of the themes in our clinic, we sort of go month by month and have a theme, is the difference between I can't versus I'm reluctant to. Now, who here has said, probably even today, I can't sit through this whole thing. I can't go to church this week. I can't get up by 8 o'clock. 
You know, I can't sit in that hard chair. I can't do that thing. Now, what that really is, is shorthand for I'm reluctant to sit in that chair because I know I'm probably going to hurt in an hour. I'm reluctant to get up at 8 because I know I'm going to be fatigued. And it's such a subtle difference, but if we really use the words, I'm reluctant to do this thing, it's a much more honest presentation, and it leaves open room to brainstorm ways you might be able to do that thing. If you tell your brain and your body, I can't do this thing, yeah, you're right. You probably can't. You've just shut out any opportunity to do it. But if you say, I'm not sure I want to do this thing because it's going to hurt, that's the same thing. It just you, leads you to maybe say, well, but maybe I could if I bring my support person or use my wheelchair or bring my cane or take breaks in the middle of the day. It leads you to brainstorm those possibilities. So definitely want you thinking about that kind of change in words. Um, evaluating anxiety. You want to try to pinpoint what it is that's sort of leading you to be the most anxious. Is it setting goals? Is it moving that limb? Are there family stressors? Do you worry each time you have to go to a certain doctor's office because you know it's going to be an unpleasant situation? Caregivers, what are your main worries? Finances, uh, what if I say the wrong thing? You know, So we really want to kind of scrub through what's happening and pinpoint that source of anxiety. One other thing I think is helpful for therapists to know, are you worrying with thoughts or images? Do you have sort of this verbal flow from the peanut gallery up there in your brain telling you all these anxious thoughts, or do you sort of see yourself? Do you see the image of yourself in distress or um, falling or something like that? And knowing kind of where your anxieties lie is helpful and figuring out how to treat it. And then the earlier you can detect physical symptoms of stress, whether it's muscle tension, pain intensity um, increase, or a lot of times GI systems and headaches, they tend to be kind of our, our vulnerable spots uh, that, that kind of indicate we're stressed. So the earlier we notice those, the better. Kind of be able to calm your, your symptoms, douse the fire before it spreads too much. This is just a little thing for clinicians. I don't know how many healthcare providers we have in the audience, but if you were to be doing any sort of questionnaires in office, you can go back to that slide and it's just some good questionnaires for you. Anger, talk about really briefly. Excuse me one second. <coughs> All right. Um, anger, of course, is associated with worse outcomes. What we find is it's not about the anger itself. Anger and frustration is completely normal. Okay, it's a normal human emotion. It's how we express it, okay? And the two extremes, either we direct anger in toward ourself and label ourselves, I'm lazy, I deserve this, I'm a failure. We direct it inward, that's not good. And if we direct it outward and try to make everyone else as un, you know, unhappy as we are and kind of yell, that shuts down communication. So we want to be able to find ways to express our frustration in a much more communicative way so that we can get help. And there's some interesting proposed mechanisms, some really good reviews by those um, authors on kind of frustration when we try to reach our goal, um, the perceived injustice. So like, you know, why me? Why did this happen to me? This is a rare disease. Why did I get it? What did I do? Why am I being punished? That rumination on sort of that injustice can get us blocked for sure. Um, and Certain, there's some interesting research about our own natural painkiller pathways. They can get blocked when we're expressing anger in the wrong way. So we really want to kind of work on that. There is a special type of sort of trick that our brain plays on us sometimes, and it is called pain catastrophizing. And has anyone heard of this word? I used it. Therapists have heard, seen this. I used it. It was my dissertation was on this. And you had to submit the dissertation to the graduate school, and then they would revise it, and they would send it back to you. And the people who read my dissertation kept sending it back saying, catastrophizing is not a word. And I was like, it's what my whole dissertation is based on. And they kept saying, you have to spell it differently. It was so bizarre. So it took me a long time to figure that out. So pain catastrophizing is something you may know. And it, the hallmark is three major things. Magnifying the pain symptoms. 
not on purpose, not exaggerating them on purpose, but just this sort of heightened experience of, of them, like this pain is killing me. Has anyone ever said that? It certainly feels like it is. This is not necessarily terminal, so we know it's not. It feels like it is. But saying that is a magnifying of how intense the pain is. Rumination is when I can't think about anything other than the pain. Really having trouble shifting your thoughts to a different focus. And then a sense of helplessness. Like there's nothing I can do to stop this. And when those three things hang together, it causes all sorts of negative outcomes. Higher pain intensity, less quality of life, depression. It impacts how our families approach us. Um, it actually enhances those, the brain activity and all those mood systems and it causes some more inflammatory responses. So we definitely want to try to treat that catastrophizing. One of the ways to do that, we call it decatastrophizing. My graduate school would say, that is not a word, <laughs> but it is. And what it is is you kind of imagine, all right, what's the worst that could happen? Then you ask yourself, what is the realistic probability that this thing will happen? And then you ask yourself, if the worst happens, could I cope with it? And if you're able to figure out ways that you can cope, because you've coped already with more than you ever thought possible. Am I right? You never expected you'd be able to, to go through this. That if when you figure it out and that brain lights up and goes, oh, I can cope with more than I thought, then you start to realize it doesn't matter what your worst case scenario is because you got it covered. So it, this is easier said than done, by the way. <laughs> this is much easier said than done. It takes a long time to try to work on some of this stuff, for sure. So some of the ways we work on this is through cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's sort of like an untangling of all our, our distorted and irrational thoughts that happen in the brain. And just helps us make more sense of them and think a little bit more rationally. So what we do is we think that sometimes there's a, a very direct correlation between a situation or an event like pain and our negative mood. But what we realize is that our behaviors in response to our mood and the thoughts we have about our situation can impact the mood outcomes as well. So what we do in cognitive behavioral therapy is a whole bunch of stuff, and that's why my job is super fun, <laughs> and I really enjoy doing this, because you have a person in front of you, and you get to individualize how can you best help them and look at all this interesting stuff we have to do. We can work on motivation, realistic goal setting, we can do relaxation um, treatments, and there's a whole bunch of those to do. And you've got to find the right one that works for you because one size does not fit all with relaxation. Um, we help people kind of get back into life and identify their valued activities, pace themselves, work on some of the other things like insomnia and weight management. So there's so much to be able to do in therapy. These are some of the um, examples. There's a whole bunch. Of the, gosh, there's probably like 25 or 30 ways, there's probably more, that our brain can play tricks on us. So, and we've labeled them all because psychologists love to name things. So we have things like mind reading. You know, maybe you're a young person and you're using a scooter in a grocery store and you're like, oh, everyone's going to be looking at me because I'm using the scooter and they're going to think I'm lazy. And we just start to chug like we know what other people are going to think about us. And so we have to identify when those thoughts are not quite accurate. Um, emotional reasoning. My body feels useless, so therefore I am useless. You know, that argument would not hold up in a court of law. So it's just sort of challenging some of these irrational beliefs our brain wants to do for whatever reason. So the way you do this is through reframing or restructuring thoughts. You start to challenge some of this negative thinking. You know, is my logic correct? I love this one. What would I tell a friend in a similar situation? You know, we have so much more empathy for others than we do for ourselves. So if you were to have a friend that came up to you and said, here is what I feel every day, and here are all the struggles, what advice would you give that friend? And then take that advice, because it's probably good advice. You're not gonna tell them to freak out or isolate. You're gonna tell them to re-engage and calm and, and do some different things. So be empathic, be kind to yourself like you would with a friend. 
There's other techniques, and I'm going to skip over these in the interest of time. Um, replacing shoulds. I, I joke with my patients a lot that we should on ourselves a lot, right? I should be able to get ready in a half an hour like I used to. I should be able to walk through Walgreens, you know? We, or he should know what I'm feeling and know how to back off. We just hold these kind of rigid thoughts about ourselves and other people, and we're going to feel like we're failing all the time. So don't shit on yourselves. Um, thinking also, this is a little more advanced, but a silver lining of pain. I was sitting at a table earlier, and one of, one of the patients said, you know, I don't know if I had to do it all over again that I, that I would want to be without my pain. Because I did something. He had achieved a goal. I'm going to, I don't know if he's still here. He hiked the Appalachian Trail to show himself that he could after his pain. He wouldn't have done that if he had not had this disease. And so it was one of those things where it was like, wow, so what have you gained? What have you learned about yourself or your friends or your family or your faith or your abilities or your resilience that you might not have learned otherwise? And that's something to really hold on to. Acceptance, big buzzword. So when we think about cognitive therapy, that's one realm of helping with pain. And the other is sort of a more acceptance-based um, technique. A lot of people, they do not like the term acceptance. It feels like it's just giving in or giving up. And it is not. Uh, when we really enhance our pain acceptance, it's associated with all sorts of good outcomes. In Dr. Chopra's little sticker, his dot system, this would be a green dot. It's be and a blue dot. It's backed by science, and it's definitely effective. Um, what we want to target with acceptance-based techniques is the suffering. This is an equation I find really helpful. We work so hard on trying to change our pain intensity that we forget that suffering is the numerator. Suffering is the driver of how bad we feel. And so if we can target the suffering component of pain, we will feel better even if our intensity is still in the moderate to severe range. I know that sounds wacky, but when we can separate those two parts, we tend to feel better. Working toward acceptance, we reduce resistance, we reduce that fight against it. We do some mindfulness training, which is really learning to be in the moment, present, sitting without judgment. There's a neat technique called cognitive diffusion where, and you could, you could do this, I would say try this tonight, five minutes, sit there in your hotel room or in the car on the way home or in the plane, and just let yourself experience what you're feeling, thinking, and sensing. So we think about our thought space up here and our emotion space. We usually feel it here, right? And then our body sensations. And as these things come up, don't label them. Don't label them as pain, stinging, a butt itch, <laughs> um, uh, anxiety, fatigue, anxiousness. Don't label it. Just say, huh, I'm having a thought. Huh, I'm having a sensation. Oh, there's an emotion. And just let them float by. And just doing that sort of simple, weird, but simple practice, five minutes or so a day, really teaches you that we're the ones that assign labels to what we are experiencing. And why are we assigning all these negative labels? We're doing it. So try to let yourself sit without the judgment. And we know, too, that living a life of purpose and valued priorities is the best way to a long-term quality of life. It's called values-based action. What are your personal goals? Is it to volunteer? Is it to be with family? Is it to care for your cat? Is it to be an, a good Facebook friend? I don't care what it is. It has to be important to you. And when we pursue that, that really helps. Um, I'm not going to go through this summary. You can read this on the online slides. The way it works it does it through a change in biology. It's not magic. This stuff sounds like black box of the brain kind of, you know, voodoo. It's not. It changes, it releases our natural painkillers. It rebalances our mood transmitters. It calms our immune system, all that inflammatory stuff. And it changes our pathways in the brain to make uh, new pathways that can be much more positive. We like to really enhance the idea of creating a literal 
pain toolbox. The idea of a toolbox is not a metaphor, folks. Like, it can be a cute little sewing bag. Mine is a, a drawer in our master bathroom where we have all of our stuff. Our TENS units are, well, I don't, you guys don't like TENS, but like the stimulator, uh, heating pads, my Kindle goes in there, humor books, whatever it's going to be. And have that for your flare days. Because any good treatment is still only going to get you part of the way. We have to be honest with that. And there will be flares. They're not to be feared. They're to be managed. And you can get the control over how to manage those. All right, just to wrap up, I want to point you to a couple other resources um, for psychological support. So some honesty here. I love what I do. I probably manage about 500 individual patients on my roster at any given time. These are very lucky patients that have found their way to a trained pain psychologist that have the financial means and they have the transportation means to get to the clinic. Not everybody has that. It is difficult to find good mental health care oftentimes in communities and especially people who understand pain. Now I do want to call out, if you, if you don't mind, Dr. Horowitz, Charles Horowitz is here in Boulder, or not here, but he, he works in Boulder. So not that far to be able to go seek him out. Runs care, it will be running caregiver support groups, pain support groups, understands chronic pain at a very visceral level. And so there are people in your communities. You can look at your state uh, psychological licensing board website and find a list of names. Or Psychology Today will often have listings for therapists and they will have whether chronic pain is a specialty. Better help, and I did not check if this was betterhelp.com or betterhelp.org, is more of a telepsychology thing now. They're sort of loosening restrictions on web-based therapy. And you can have your own counselor assigned to you and do it online. So if you can't physically get into an office, you can still find individual counseling. And I think it's probably based on either a flat fee or a sliding scale basis. I'm not sure the cost of that. But you want to try to reach out to people. If, I'm sorry, what was that? Dot com? Is that something somebody said? Okay, betterhelp.com. If not... There are some stuff you can do on your own. So there are some good workbooks I just want to show you, okay? It's kind of all self-management based. Managing pain before it manages you. It's not for CRPS specifically, but it's for general pain. Excellent, classic workbook. It's been around forever. The relaxation and stress reduction workbook is going to be more, it'll give you a whole bunch of different muscle relaxation, visual imagery, a whole bunch of different scripts, and talk about ways to calm the inflammation and the, and the stress. Mind over mood classic workbook for home um, guidance through cognitive therapy. They actually take you step by step on how to catch those thoughts, how to label those negative thoughts, and how to reframe them and challenge them. So you could do a little bit of this on your own at home in a workbook form at your own pace. You know, 20 bucks for a workbook, that's not, that's not too bad. Um, further support, more in the mindfulness or acceptance-based realm. There are a bunch of acceptance gurus out there. John Kabat-Zinn on the right, he really brought mindfulness-based stress reduction to the masses in America. My personal preference is Ronald Siegel. I really like the way he teaches mindfulness. And on his website, mindfulness-solution.com, there are all sorts of downloadable free um, uh, sessions, 20-minute sessions about uh, empathy, the loving-kindness meditation, and separating the arrows of pain intensity and suffering. Some really excellent free resources there. Clinicians, these are more for mental health clinicians. There's a step-by-step -step guide for cognitive therapy for pain, motivational interviewing. I'm not going to belabor that. We probably don't have that many here. And then for caregivers, um, you know, full disclosure, the one on the left is by my boss, but he, he's been in business since 79 as a pain psychologist. Um, and he says that over 275,000 patients went into the writing of that book and really is helpful for having family members understand what you're going through, the painful truth, uh, what chronic pain is really like and why it matters, and then a self-compassion workbook. Caregivers, we beat up on ourselves a lot. 
did I do the right thing? Did I say the right thing? Did I make the right decision? So really working on enhancing self-compassion, self-kindness is important. And I am a big fan of this meditation. It's called loving kindness, and here's a link to it. Um, it really helps you develop. You have empathy in spades for other people, clearly, but it helps you also develop that self-empathy. Uh, so I find that's a good resource. And then anybody can make use of so many opportunities online and at home now. So there are apps that are fantastic. There's the Headspace app. One of the caregivers today mentioned the Calm app, C-A-L-M. Download those. They're either free trials and very a small price for the full thing. I use a Cardia breathing pacer app, and that just helps you do a symmetrical breathing that the, the nervous system really likes. Um, in that realm, I do a lot of biofeedback with patients, and you can do that with a professional, but there are also home devices. So you can kind of do like an earlobe monitor or a finger monitor, and it goes on your phone or your computer, depending on which one you get, and it gives you a window into your nervous system in real time, and it trains you on how to balance the fight or flight system with the calming system, and it trains it, and it has all sorts of really neat visual games and tools. So that is worth maybe a small investment in those. They're not that much, maybe $100. It's, I mean, I, that could be a lot, but in the grand scheme of what you're getting and you're saving on some therapy, then it's good. This mindfulness course here, Palos Mindfulness, it says um, palosmindfulness.com is what's cut off. It is a free 12-week mindfulness-based stress reduction course that this therapist has put online. So it has training and reading and videos and relaxation techniques. And it is just amazing. Again, you can go on at your own pace. So if you feel frustrated or scared because you don't know how to access one-to-one -one help in your community, you can still find quite a bit of resources uh, on your own at home. So I want to thank you. I'm actually going to, I would like to decline to take questions because I'm losing my voice, but I will make myself available. You're going to find me cozy on the leather couch outside of that fireplace that has been calling my name all day. I will be there. If you want to talk about any of these things, I am. we can't do a couch therapy session because I'm not your therapist, but we can certainly chat about resources. You are also very welcome to email me. So if you want a copy of the slides or if you want uh, any recommendations of people in your area or what would really be the right thing for you, I'm more than happy to interact in that way. So thank you for your time, and here's to your better mental health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne. Outstanding.